Good afternoon, folks, and welcome into the Resine Common Paint Problems and Paint Guarantees webinar. Rob Mountford here with you again today. And our Technical Services Manager, Jeff Jelena, uh, had so much fun in our last webinar, he's decided to sit on, on this one as well. So hello, Jeffrey. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, now, today's session is a nice, simple one, uh, as it's a fairly basic look at some of the more common issues that pop, pop up. And uh, we'll also take a closer look at what paint guarantees cover, or probably more importantly, what they don't actually cover out there. Um, hopefully it's gonna put some context around things for you and give you a bit of useful info out in the field uh, as and when you need it. We'll try to get to some questions as well at the end, but uh, Jeff does ramble on a bit. So um, if we don't get to the Q and A, we'll come back to you afterwards as usual. So we're going to shut our webcams down now and crack into it for you. That's us gone, so away we go. So the purpose of today, um, we're going to have a look at a selection of common issues. Now these issues are typically perceived as a paint problem. And we all too often we get phone calls coming in saying there's something wrong with my paint. What we're gonna show you today is almost always it's not actually the paint that uh, has the issue, it's something else that's going on that's causing um, a, a paint failure. And we're gonna show you what paint guarantees actually cover out there because there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding or misinterpretation, should I say, of paint guarantees mm -hmm. and what they're actually covering you for. So we'll have a quick look. Uh, we're not covering uh, all substrates. We're gonna have a look at um, issues on timber, concrete and interiors, and then paint guarantees as well, obviously. Now, we're only showing you a selection of the more common issues that come up. There's a lot more than what we'll see today, but um, hopefully that this will give you a general indication, give you some nice visual references of the issues that uh, you may see out in the field. We're gonna start with a, a general one. Uh, now this, this type of issue, uh, chalking occurs on all uh, substrates and all painted surfaces. It's when the UV light uh, and general weathering breaks down the binders and the paint surface over time and you get that uh, chalk-like dust on the surface. It's often mistaken for fading uh, because it, the, the surface of the, of the color is, is turning white, I guess with that chalk-like dust. It's something that can't be prevented. Um, however, using good quality paints and higher gloss paints uh, slows, the, slows the onset of chalking. Um, as you see, we have some schematics that, that are there as well with the images. Uh, the, the blue arrows are moisture, the red arrow is indicates UV. Um, and as we go through, we'll give you also the um, remedies for, for dealing with this. In chalking, it's really a, a simple thing. It's You can clean this off the surface uh, using the right uh, cleaning solutions and scrubbing methods, not water blasting. Uh, that's, a, that's a, uh, I guess, a mistake we see a lot of people trying to water blast roofs. It doesn't remove chalking. Uh, it needs that scrubbing uh, effect to remove chalking as you go. Yeah, the, the other thing about chalking is that when it occurs, it will be first seen on the northern elevation because that's the elevation that receives the most intense weathering. And so when chalking occurs, that is where you see it first. And in fact, you can get some properties where there's severe chalking on the northern elevation and virtually the southern looks as good as it was the day it was first painted. It's all about weather and the effects of. So we'll jump into uh, timber substrates now. Uh, lifting and peeling, we'll all have seen this on the side of houses, uh, particularly old weatherboard houses. It's often the older original coatings in poor condition uh, and painted with new, more flexible coatings. What this does is it creates a surface tension and lifts the old coatings from the surface, it creates like a vacuum-like -like effect. And it highlights that the underlying adhesion is, is poor uh, and often some of those coatings have been on the houses since they were built. And, you know, particularly here in, in Auckland and, and likely in other parts of the country, Wellington as well, is we've got uh, 
old bungalows and villas that were built 100, 120 years ago, and they still have the original primers on them. So um, it's the surface tension of that new coating over the top that it actually is pulling that old coating off the surface. And that's not a that's not a, uh, an issue with the new coating. That's quite simply, you've got old poorly adhere, or poorly adhering underlying coatings. Darker colors pump more heat into the substrate and are gonna cause that um, issue as well. So when we're out specking things, we test for adhesion, we do crosshatch tests and good surface preparations required as well. Um, when you're looking at something like this, if you saw this all over the house, the house needs to be stripped and started again. Yeah, in, in general, if you're dealing, as Rob said, with an old bungalow um, or a property that has 10 plus layers of paint coating, that's really the time that you should strip back to bare and start again. With some of the older paint systems, you have to be aware of the possibility for the presence of lead and take that into account when you're doing your surface preparation. Uh, sharp edge slitting, now this is something we see more on uh, newer homes and this is caused by the sharp edge on your weatherboard, that's, that's the image of a, of a weatherboard of course. We're at time of um, preparation, those sharp edges should be rounded off the corners or arrest off the corner to uh, a two mil kind of radius. Uh, that often doesn't happen. The, the, the issue with that is wet film actually pulls back from that sharp edge and you end up with a far thinner um, coating at that point. Over time with the expansion and uh, contraction and movement of the timber, you get a hairline crack open up at that point, moisture sneaks in and all of a sudden you have this, the effect that you see there on screen. Uh, the other issue that can um, impact on this as well as factory primers or uh, transit primers for the uh, new weatherboards when they come in, that they're not correctly primed again uh, or uh, manufacturer's instructions followed for repriming those boards. So not, not much you can do there other than removing those sharp edges, sanding those sharp edges off and priming and repainting. Yes, yeah, stripe, stripe coating of those sharp edges will help because in effect, you're putting three applications of paint onto that sharp edge. And as they uh, pull back, you will hopefully end up with the correct film build. But removing the sharp edge is the only way to be 100% sure that you're not going to have that issue occur. And this is the ne next area that will occur on uh, on weatherboards as well. That impact area where you've got that sharp edge um, splitting of the coating occurs because of the angle that that uh, that the board's at at this point. You will then have the lifting and flaking occur at this point on the weatherboard as well. So there's a bit of a flow-on effect um, to sharp edge splitting. Typically, uh, just, oh, sorry, sorry where you go. Uh, when we do um, exterior exposure testing, the panels are exposed to the north at 45 degrees. That exposure angle is equal to twice the exposure that the same paint system and board would receive if it was exposed in a vertical orientation. Yeah, and that's that's an important uh, point to note as well because we'll touch on that in a few slides time when we look at window sills because that's exactly the issue on a window sill. It's far more exposed um, because of the angle that it's at. Um, so this is just standard splitting in timber. This is a movement along the, the grain boundary uh, and a hairliner crack occurs and what it does is it allows moisture um, ingress and a loss of adhesion at that point. So again, this is one of those problems that will get um, a call about and uh, it's viewed as paint failure, but it's not at all. This is a, this is the substrate moving and a hairline crack occurring. And everyone has to remember that paint is only uh, a, a three coat system of paint is only 100 to 120 microns. It's a thousand microns in a millimeter, so you're dealing with one tenth of a millimeter in a paint coating. And where hairline cracks open up, uh, the paint will open up at that point as well. Yeah, the, the, the reason for that is that unless you're using um, an elastomeric 
um, coating. Typically, standard coatings, while they are extensible, they're not elastomeric. So you, they can be extended in this situation, but there will come a point when that extension will exceed the, um, the ability of the paint to retain its film and that the paint film will crack. Uh, in grain or cut in cut splitting. Uh, so we see this a lot in, in older older dwellings. Uh, it's again natural movement causes the cracks to open up over time. Moisture sneaks in, and then you get it drawn into the timber. Um, in new construction, we seal the end grains. Uh, they should be primed. Hopefully, uh, in this type, hopefully, yeah. In this type of situation, this is difficult or impossible to fix. Um, particularly on an older property like this. So you'd have to scrape this all back, uh, fill the areas. We use flexible epoxy systems now that we'll talk about as well. Um, and, or you'd seal the crevices with, with paintable flexible sealants. But I think when we see this, uh, sometimes there's an expectation that, that it can be fixed. If, if the timber's not um, cut out of that, it's, you're not gonna fix that and it's, it's likely to reoccur again at some point in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, but yeah, based on my own experience of exactly this problem, if you do the repair in summer, there's a better chance of the repair being successful for a much longer time period. In winter, when the that end section is full of water, um, the end cut of a piece of timber will absorb 10 times the amount of water than the face of the weatherboard. So if you try doing this work in winter, that end cut is absolutely full of water. So you're not really achieving much. So this type of repair is best done over, over summer. Now back onto the cracked timber sashes and sills, just as we're talking about the exposure to UV on sills um, is far greater than a vertical surface. Natural movement in timber again causes cracks to open up. Uh, the expansion and contraction through the sea seasons and moisture ingress. Now, it, this is very, very difficult. It's a common thing for us to see out there and just simply repainting these windows, um, you're not gonna prevent cracks opening up uh, and the same issues occurring again over time. And we do see, on, particularly on window sills as well, there's an expectation that repainting them uh, is going to give you a, a, a long-term lifespan in that paint coating. And it's one of the areas we'll touch on on paint guarantees as well, is window sills, uh, you know, and when they're in poor condition, and this, this isn't the worst window sill I've seen, but when they're in poor condition, uh, those hairline cracks will open up again in a, in a very short period of time, and, a, and you will have uh, paint peeling and lifting off the surface fairly quickly. So it's unrealistic to think that just a standard repaint on something like this is going to give you, um, you know, I'll pull a number out, 10 years or whatever, num whatever number is, is bandied around. You're not, if, that, if those windows were north facing, uh, you, you would have a very short time before your cracks were opening up again and you were um, dealing with issues. Now, yeah. As mentioned before, we do have flexible epoxy repair systems that can often deal with some of this in a much better, um, much better way than some of the older, um, older type fillers. Yeah, but what this actually shows though is that there is always a need, especially if you've got timber for ongoing maintenance and that needs to be done as soon as a defect is seen in a paint system it's a lot easier to affect a longer term repair than if you allow the window condition to deteriorate to the state that was in that slide. We'll flick through this one fairly quickly because it's, it's similar to what we've just been talking about. This is just butt joints, same, same deal, cracking. You can't, you can't stop this occurring in older timber. Um, yeah, we'll flick through this one. We've covered, covered that off fairly well, I think. Crack putty. Now, this is the bane of our life. Uh, the uh, this uh, this is the same types of issues with timber moving in uh, over time. Long term weathering of of um, uh, of the putty allows moisture to creep in behind and cause a failure. Um, when this 
the only thing you can do is rake the putty out and um, ensuring that you're priming the rebate area as well with a good quality primer. Now, the selection of putties uh, nowadays is, is, is fairly extensive as to what you can use. Uh, there are new modern glazing sealants that perform better than the older uh, putties. And there's, there's a varying time frames as to when and how you can paint uh, the older style putties. And sometimes it can take weeks and weeks and weeks for putty to be ready uh, to have cured properly and be ready for your paint coating over. Um, yeah, and that's where we we um, we do point people in the direction of the new modern uh, glazing sealants because they're once once people get their heads around how to apply them, um, they are they are the type of product that can be painted fairly quickly after they're applied. Weatherboard shrinkage. Now, this is something that's very common to see. Um, and it quite simply again comes back to um, moisture content of timber and timber expands and contracts through the seasons uh, based depending on the moisture uptake and weatherboards are designed to move and they will uh, uh, shrink and swell over the seasons. When we, uh, the common thing nowadays is we like to paint our weatherboards darker. Uh, they, we used to paint them white. When we paint them darker, we see those lines open up as the as the boards are expand, uh, shrinking during the seasons. It's a difficult thing to to avoid. In fact, you really can't avoid it. And it's I guess it's an education thing out there, and it's something that we're constantly trying to um, to provide the information on. Is when people paint their weatherboards dark, this is a very common thing to see, and it it's no fault of the paint. Uh, it's you, it's your timber weatherboards doing what they'll always do through the seasons. The, the movement is always as you see. It occurs between boards and it doesn't usually occur along a board. Um, it's always best to ensure that if you've got new weatherboards that the back of the weatherboards are primed. That can help control moisture um, level changes and but it still won't necessarily fix the problem that's shown in that photo. Mm. Now, this is a this is a thing that the next step on from the movement and weatherboards is it's become popular to um, to fill the fill the gaps. And what occurs with that is with that movement, the sealant tears as the as the boards expand and contract, and they quite simply can't. Um, uh, can't maintain the, the sealant integrity. Our view on it is that the gaps shouldn't be sealed. It's also brands view uh, that, that they have as well, that those gaps are not intended to be sealed. They're an expansion joint. And this will almost always occur. Um, there are some uh, sealants out there that are specifically for this. Uh, but our view, as I say, is that you don't fill those gaps you allow the boards to move naturally as they always will. Tannin staining. Uh, now I'll let you speak on this one, Jeffrey. Yeah, okay. So, tannin staining is it's the yellow, red, brown material that migrates through the paint or stain surface. Now it is always associated with application of a waterborne paint or stain. From a viewpoint of durability, it doesn't really change the durability of the stain or the paint. It is really a cosmetic um, appearance issue. Most hardwoods, the quillas and the um, black hearts and that type of timber contain tannins. The currently accepted theory is that the tannins are there to protect the timber from insect um, predation. So they are they have a functional um, operation within the actual uh, weatherboard um, in terms of protective. Now, if you're going to paint over a timber that contains tannin, 
The other common timber in New Zealand that contains tannin are tannins, the redwood or cedar. You either let the timber weather or you wash the stain out to remove the tannin content from the surface. You use an alkali wash solution and give it a scrub and then rinse it off. And if you look at Quila, the colour before and after um, applying a tannin wash solution is very, very pronounced. The other way is to apply a tannin stain block paint. Typically, these are solvent-borne paints because it is only water that will solubilize the tannins and cause them to move. Cool. Uh, now we're on to resin bleed. We see this a lot um, with finger jointed pine weatherboards and this is a natural process and it's really difficult to stop if there's a high resin content in that section of timber. Um, all you can do with this is really scrape it off, allow a few days for that underlying resin to harden and then you prime it with, a, um, with an alkyd primer, typically our aluminium wood primer. And that's the best thing we can do to block resin bleed occurring. Uh, you can't stop this, and often it'll push back through those primers as well because it's a it's a process that's occurring from the timber substrate. And like many of the other timber issues, the darker the colour, the greater the chance of of resin bleed. Uh, when you now, are using finger jointed. Um, pine weatherboards, all the finger jointing process does is remove the knots and then glues the pieces back together again. There's no selection of timber that contains a certain uh, resin content. So you can get this even in high quality um, timber, finger jointed timber cladding as well. Usually with pine, Cedar is not prone to the same issue. And the image that we've got on screen there is often uh, something that we see with the, exactly that issue uh, with finger jointed pine boards where it's actually the usually the smaller sections as well um, with resin showing through at that point. Um, again, all you can do with that is, is um, is uh, scrape off residue or sand back those areas and prime with an aluminium wood primer. So no fault of the paint coating over the top at that point. Uh, we'll start flicking through things a bit quicker, Jeff, because I think we're um, we're we're slightly but behind time. So clear coatings. We've we've covered this one. We've covered this one. Uh, yeah. Previously, but again, we don't recommend putting clear coatings in New Zealand on exterior timber. Uh, simply doesn't protect the um, timber substrate from the UV impact and the coating breaks down, uh, the, the timber, underlying timber breaks down, causing the coating to break down prematurely. Uh, a lot of the clear coatings that are on the market are not um, designed and formulated for New Zealand conditions and they sim this is a really common thing to see here um, and our recommendation is, is quite simply not to use poly clear film forming polyurethanes in exterior conditions in New Zealand. They will simply break down prematurely. Uh, we do cover that a, a lot more detail in our timber webinar that we did a few months ago with John Kilby. Um, this, is a, this is a flow on from that, the same thing as well, under film mold occurring in uh, clear coatings. Uh, generally the mold spores are already there. Um, but moisture can solubilize the sugars uh, present in timber and it just simply creates a food source for the mold spores. And you put a clear coating over the top and everything's trapped in there and you just get, you get mold occurring. So not much you can do with that uh, other than stripping it off and uh, recoating the surface. We do see that in interior situations sometimes and in, in, uh, indoors. And again, it's no fault of the paint, uh, the clear coating it's it's the mold spores already present on that timber surface. Uh, we'll flick through uh, weather erosion. Now this is exterior stains. So something we get asked a lot about is why is my why is my stain um, eroding off the surface? Well, that's exactly what exterior um, penetrating stains are designed to do. Um, 
And of course, north facing elevations will erode much faster than south facing, just simply with the, the impact of UV, UV at that point. It's a natural process, can't be avoided. And um, most stains on the market require maintenance. When we say maintenance, we mean recoding every every couple of summers. Now, that's certainly in a north facing situation. South facing, you might find that you um, you, you don't require recoding um, quite as often. So that's something that varies depending on the sites. And this is a really common thing to see as well with weather erosion. And this is typically. Um, one you see in the images on the right there, you see a different cut. You see half stone boards and quarter stone, but it's also to do with early and late wood timber. Um, so the different growth that occurs uh, as the um, there's a different porosity of the timber at that point, and so the stain is soaked into the timber uh, better in one area and not the other. So as that erodes off, that grain presents itself in quite a dramatic. Um, uh, quite, quite a dramatic way, but that again is a natural process that's occurring and it can't be avoided. Um, we would recommend quarter sawn boards, boards, as you see there on the right hand side, are, are better for use on north and west elevations, uh, as you're going to see less of that erosion occurring. But again, this is quite simply requires maintenance, so it needs a clean down and a restain. So we're going to jump into cementitious substrates now. And our friend efflorescence, we see this a lot. Um, this is only related to moisture. Uh, so this can only occur, occur if moisture is present. Carries calcium hydroxide or lime to the surface and it reacts with carbon dioxide and it forms that calcium carbonate that you see, which is efflorescence. To deal with this, you have to eliminate the source of moisture. Um, painting over this, we do have primers that we put over things but it doesn't solve it, it'll come back. Um, you have to eliminate the source of moisture that's, um, that is causing this. And to, to remedy it, it's just a stiff brush and carefully wash down and spot prime. And, and we typically prime with a solvent-based pigmented sealer. Again, if you don't remove the moisture, you'll, you'll have this reoccur. Yeah, the, uh, the, the moisture that Rob is referring to is coming through the substrate. It's not moisture from rain or anything like that. Yep. So this is this is something that's associated with it as well, and really common for us to see um, interior block walls like this. This has got some efflorescence occurring at those at the pointing. You can see, um, and this, if it's this, is obviously a fairly new. Um, what we see in commercial environments is you'll see big concrete block walls, and it will just be covered with efflorescence because there's moisture. Uh, ingress occurring on the outside of the um, outside of the wall, and unless you stop that occurring, um, this is these are the kind of issues that you will see. Um, often there's a misunderstanding that it's the paint coating on the outside that's allowing moisture in, and but generally it's to do with uh, roof lines, concealed gutters, uh, poor flashings, uh, window details, joinery uh, can all be sources of moisture. It's really common to see it underneath windows. Um, so in this type of situation, we, we would we would get a call to say, look, we want to put put a paint coating on the inside of my blocks here to to deal with this. And our advice would always be, you need to deal with the outside first, and we'd be looking at a weather tight membrane like Resine X200 or the like. And depending on what's going on on the outside, uh, but you need to get a weather tight. Um, uh, surface on the outside and deal with any any other issues that are occurring uh, before you deal with the inside. Yeah, so you know, typically in this situation, you don't see low build um, paint systems being used. It's always high build because that's the only way that you can render the substrate weather type. So this, this image is lime burn, and this is, if you can see that haloed effect in the image, uh, this is really common if uh, fresh um, uh, cement renders are painted too soon after they're applied, is that initial render is it's very, uh, very alkaline. And when you paint over too soon, uh, you get burn through from the lime that burns through the binders and um, that you see this haloed effect. So once it's occurred, um, there's not much you can do about it. 
the prevention of this is you need to either allow that uh, cement-based render to cure for 28 days before uh, painting, or we do have specialist limelock uh, primer sealers in our range to deal with this. So um, ours are simply called limelock. Uh, Again, not much you can do with this now that it's occurred. Uh, simply painting over, we would we would we would specify spot priming it with a um, with a pigmented sealer. Um, sometimes it reoccurs because it's happening at the um, at the um, render level. Yeah, you you can also get a similar effect on certain colours as well because the pigments are not stable to high pH. Uh, so lime staining again, it's very similar. It is it's similar to efflorescence. It's lime staining, and it's caused by moisture. Um, when you see an image like this, or when you see something like this, you've got a lot of moisture going on behind that wall. Often it's a retaining wall. Um, if it hasn't been tanked correctly, and this this it's really common that they haven't been tanked correctly. Correctly, you you really can't fix this um, or stop this from occurring. Um, it's it's a really costly exercise to dig out behind walls. Very few people will do it, um, and so this this is a type of issue that uh, you are not going to be able to to remedy at all. We would just you just deal with this on a regular maintenance cycle, scrubbing that off the surface, spot priming. I've got something fairly similar to this at home, um, and it's just a regular annual um, touch up for me. It's just an aesthetic thing um, uh, on a dark dark wall mine's very similar to that and I just uh, scrub it off and uh, spot prime it with a shore seal and and, and um, touch it up and then a few months later as we go through winter I see it occurring again so I can't do anything about it. Old bitumen coatings this is quite common um, just through that phase of um, when this was all we had as a waterproofing membrane. So you would put the uh, two to five coats of the black bitumen emulsion on, and then you'd put a, a latex coating over the top. So eventually the intercoat adhesion uh, becomes really weak and poor, and, and there's not, you end up with a, with a total failure of, of the coating um, on the side of a building. So obviously nowadays we've got uh, modern weather type membranes that we would specify in these situations, but they didn't have them back in the day. So um, basically to, to remove this, you just need to strip everything off or to deal with this, should I say, you just need to strip everything off um, and remove as much of that um, black bitumen coating as you can. Uh, we have specialist primers, uh, a specialist primer to deal with it. If you can't get it off the wall, it's, it, and that's a pretty common thing, not being able to remove it all. So you need to prime with a specialist um, membrane primer that deals with the bitumen, and then we would overcoat it, depending on um, depending on uh, the situation. Likely with a um, something like a Resin X200, which is a weather type membrane. Precast and tilt slab. Uh, now this, again, an image is really common to see. And uh, what this relates to is it's the failure to remove the form oils and release agents from the manufacturing process prior to painting. Again, a uh, common mistake is water blasting the surface to uh, remove the form oils. Uh, now you don't, water doesn't remove oil, it'll just move it around on the surface. So to remove this adequately, you actually have to scrub it down uh, with an emulsifiable solvent cleaner and all too often this isn't done and if specialist primers aren't used uh, the paint coating will will delaminate off the surface pretty quickly um, once it's occurred it's a it's a difficult thing to deal with again you just have to to deal with the areas that are that are um, having the issue typically north facing areas um, for those in Auckland, there's a there's a really high profile bridge that's a, a beautiful piece of formwork that's been done not uh, too long ago. It's at the Parnell Bars coming across Tamaki Drive. If you look up as you drive underneath it, uh, because of all the formwork on it, um, you'll see that um, the paint coating hasn't lasted particularly well on there. And that will be simply because it wasn't uh, degreased um, to remove those form oils at time of painting. Water source blisters, really common for us to see this as well. Um, this is obviously where there's moisture in behind a coating. And often uh, often what's occurred here is that we've applied weather tight coatings because we've identified there's an issue 
and your weather tight coating is doing its job uh, very well in this type of situation it's actually catching the moisture from behind so again it, this is generally a construction issue or a design issue and we need to be checking flashings cappings drainage vapor barriers all those kind of things your construction joints and window reveals we really need to find the source of moisture um, to deal with it and a paint coating on the outside of the building is not going to resolve an issue like this um, and this is a really common one that we see where people feel is that there's a problem with the paint and in fact our paint's doing a great job at this point it's it's hanging on to that moisture um, the problem is it's coming from the wrong side of the um, of the coating Painted construction sealants, this is really common as well. Uh, until recently, uh, construction sealants and tilt slab and the like weren't paintable and the plaster sizes in the sealants migrate through the coating and it causes it to become tacky very quickly or immediately and it picks up dirt. It's a pretty simple thing. The dirt just gets stuck in that area and it discolors that area. Um, the, the recommendations are not to paint over construction sealants unless they are specif or sp uh, specifically state that they can be painted and there's very few out there from what we're aware and even then they'll say uh, test that um, test the sealant first to make sure that the, there's no issues with the paint coating so no remedy to this um, typically people will just paint over the top of that and concrete spalling now I've thrown this one in we do see this commonly Clearly, this is not an issue with, with paint coatings. This is usually um, to do with insufficient concrete cover um, along with weather conditions. So the um, concrete erodes a bit and, the, and a, the moisture gets in and the, um, the steel in behind starts corroding and expanding and it pops, the, um, it pops that area of concrete off the surface. Um, they can be quite significant issues and uh, really difficult to deal with, um, really difficult to deal with. And, and our recommendations when we see these kind of things is always going to be to um, engage a specialist to give you the right kind of information to deal with it. We're now going to just jump quickly into interior substrates. Um, adhesion failure, and this is just due to steam and water, and this is this is quite simply, we see a lot of this, particularly you'll note that that's over a, over a shower area, it's just quite simply poor surface pre preparation, sometimes incompatible coatings, uh, and a lack of a really good barrier, um, good moisture barrier seal out prior to top coats. We would specify when repainting a ceiling in a bathroom, often we specify uh, Resine Shore Seal, which is a pigmented sealer, uh, the buildup of steam and moisture and condensation just sits on that edge, sits on the surface and just sneaks underneath and you get that ribbon ribbon effect occurring down the edge where it just slowly um, moves further behind that coating and lifts it from the surface. Uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to rake all that back and then we'd recommend sealing it again with, um, as I say, with shore seal. So fact and leaching, this is a really common interior and exterior. Um, this is almost always perceived as a paint issue. It's not, uh, it's a, it occurs in all waterborne coatings, uh, waterborne uh, acrylic coatings. And it's quite simply when uh, moisture hits the surface too soon after it's been painted and hasn't had a chance to cure properly. The water softens uh, the fresh paint and it draws out the water soluble surfactants that are in the coating and it just dry, they dry on the surface and you see those water marks running down the surface. Um, to prevent this happening, what we need is good airflow and drying conditions at time of painting. So this almost always we see this in, in bathrooms because there simply isn't very good drying conditions in those types of environments. And um, everyone wants to use this shower too soon after um, the, the paint coating being applied and this is what you get. Uh, this, is, this is not specific to uh, us as uh, a paint manufacturer, this is across all paint manufacturers. They'll talk to you about surfactant leaching in the same, same manner we're, we're discussing it today. It's easy to clean down if you get to it soon after, so you just clean it down with a mild detergent and warm water and often, um, often those surfactants will wipe off the wipe off the surface. The longer you leave it, 
uh, the more likely they are to etch into that surface and they, they're difficult to remove. Stress cracking, you're still with me, Jeffrey. There, you've gone very quiet. Yeah. Well, good. you you gave me an instruction to be quiet. <laughs> That's all right. You'll I'll spark you up again in a few minutes when we hit guarantees. Uh, stress cracking. This again is is a common thing to see. This is just multiple coats of paint applied over weak plaster compounds. So often where repairs have done. Uh, the new surface tension and the, and the paint coating pulls off um, the plaster from the surface. And it it's, can be to do with the plasters um, not given time to dry properly before you're painting over it. And that's that's quite common, we're all on tight schedules. Plaster does take some time. And if you saw our um, previous webinar that covered off um, interior uh, finishes when we we're talking about plasterboard and you saw the, um, saw the chart that we put up around the timeframes around relate that relate to temperatures for plaster compounds to dry can be days and days and days for uh, compounds to dry, um, and often we're we're on such tight schedules that um, paint gets put on too soon after. So again, this is to do with the um, an underlying issue with the plaster compound letting go. Stress point cracking, this is really common. Uh, we do get some call, calls about this fairly regularly. Um, one thing I would say is paint um, doesn't crack in straight lines. Uh, when you see straight lines like this, this is the substrate underneath that's moving, uh, causing, the, causing the paint coating to crack. Paint coating is not strong enough to hold two, um, uh, two bits of uh, plasterboard or timber together. It will let go if there's movement in those um, in those substrates. And this one you, you see is incorrect placement of plasterboard. You, you don't put your joints there. That's won't get too much into where they go. There's a lot of info. Our friends at JIB on their site guide that, that show you very clearly how, um, how plasterboard should be installed. Uh, but this is a common thing to see. Um, and it, people forget as well, when you repaint areas um, and paint over this, people always forget that there was a crack there already. And these, these types of cracks will open up very, very quickly um, soon after repainting um, if you haven't dealt with it and you can't really deal with this. Maybe on the plasterboard, you could put um, some paper tape there, but it may still occur. And bridging, which is a, a, in the same kind of area as where, um, in this particular one where the, where the timber trims touching the plasterboard, uh, there's no sealant in there and we, we all load up the paint uh, in the, in the um, in jam there, you can see it as well. We load up the paint at that point and then there's some movement and the, and the paint will, will uh, can't cope with that movement and it'll crack at that point. So um, we need to use the right kind of sealers um, and fillers, flexible sealants um, where possible to cope with that. Critical lighting, we'll, we'll flick through this pretty quick. We've covered that off in a couple of webinars. Uh, again, that comes down to um, the plastering that's occurred and the, and the light, the critical light angle of where that where it's coming from hits, you, hits the surface at a shallow angle. It's going to um, cast shadows on imperfections and you'll see that that'll change during the day. The way we deal with this, if you can only repaint, is we drop we drop down those sheen levels and in, in the paint coatings. So the lower the sheen, the the uh, the more it scatters that light around, and the less likely you are to see imperfections. And that's about the only way you can deal with this without um, without replastering an in, in area. Wavy surface. That's the same thing that we're just talking about with with. Um, with critical lighting, that's a that's a that's a brute of a of a ceiling there. Nothing you can do about that. That's issues with framing um, and uh, and other areas and the, and uh, a whole lot of construction issues there. So, but that's a critical light issue. Coverage, we've talked about this as well. Uh, often we get the call. Um, I don't mind talking about this one as many times as I get the chance to. Um, quite simply, if a contractor is putting the paint on you at the correct rates uh, using the right tools, we generally don't get any issues with coverage. So this is quite simply that image that you see there is, is poor technique, that's spraying it, they're simply just creating a, a mess there, there's no paint on the wall uh, and then they'll come along and put their top coats over that and say 
there's something wrong with the top coats. So quite simply, uh, for coverage, if the contractors are putting enough paint on and using the correct tools, they do not have issues with coverage. Roller marks, this is an application issue. This is quite simply the paint's drying too fast and um, poor technique and application methods. So we, we have additives that you can add into, um, into coatings, uh, hot weather additives that extend the wet edge times, keeps that wet, the, the film wet longer and allows them to roll the next area into it and it all blends in and dries nicely and you get a nice uniform finish. Yeah, the other thing that I think people forget in that context is that hot air rises. So quite often yep. the temperature at the ceiling can be quite mm. different to the temperature at the floor. Right, now I'll allow you to speak again on this one, Jeffrey, um, as we go through. Um, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes to go. Paint guarantees. So what does a paint manufacturer's guarantee actually cover? So as you've just seen with all the all the issues that we've looked at um, uh, just now, that there, there's actually nothing in there that is actually a paint failure or a paint product issue. All, all of the things that we've looked at are to do with substrates or um, the environment that's in or moisture issues. Um, and when we're dealing with them, there's, you know, we give advice on those things, but not one of those was actually a paint product failure. So what does a paint manufacturer's guarantee actually cover? Well, in general terms, it just covers the quality of the paint product only. We're not covering the workmanship of the contractor. Um, that's their responsibility. And there's a number of other areas that the workman, that the contractor, sorry, covers as well or is in control of. And I'm about to show you what they are as we go through. Uh, so Resine Paint, we're the manufactured under um, ISO programs, 9001 and 14001 quality and environmental management certification program. So we are, we are manufacturing our product to um, a high standard and we're audited on that as well. So everything that goes out that leaves our, leaves our factory um, has gone through um, the, the, the correct certification programs to say it's a quality product and it's fit for purpose. So there's a general misunderstanding out there that the time period guarantee on the side of a paint pail is the length of time that the product will actually last in any situation before a, a repaint is required. And this is simply not the case and claims uh, are often misinterpreted unless you're reading the exclusions and the terms and conditions of the guarantee and you're fully understanding what's excluded from the guarantee. So in simple terms, the lifespan of a paint coating, it's greatly affected by the workmanship standards, substrate type and condition, the adherence to the specifications, industry guidelines, and exposure levels and conditions. And these are all things that we're not in control of as a paint manufacturer. We provide you or anyone with a quality pail of paint, but once it leaves our door, we're not in control of anything there. And there's other areas as well that we'll show you in the next few slides. So substrates and exposures have a, have a part to play as well, huge part to play. And, and just as an example, I thought I'd throw this in. So paint coatings on north facing timber have a far, far shorter um, expected lifespan than paint coatings on south facing concrete. Um, coatings on substrates that are affected by heat stress, heat stress will always have a shorter lifespan than coatings on substrates that aren't. So there on the left hand side, you see a timber, vertical timber weatherboard home, north facing, painted black. Uh, on the right, you see a south facing concrete building painted in a light color. Now that building, the house on the left is going to have a far, far shorter um, lifespan on its paint coatings than the building on the right hand side. Um, that building on the right looks like it was painted uh, maybe 30 years ago at a guess. Yep, it's dirty, needs a clean down, but or, you know, all things considered, it's actually in not too bad a condition uh, for that for that period of time. In 30 years time, if you didn't touch that house on the right, um, it would look quite different to what it looks like there. So it's really important to understand that uh, paint coatings will perform differently depending on their exposure levels and the situation that they're in and the substrate they're on. Uh, again, we've already talked about this as well, timber facing, 
um, timber facing, excuse me, north facing timber joinery, and particularly uh, window sills are, ex are affected significantly more due to the angle to the sun, um, which, are, which we've talked about increases the UV impact. So, so again, when you get a generic number uh, as a paint guarantee, um, that, that's, that needs to be considered in the different areas of the dwelling or the building. North facing timber um, joinery and window sills are gonna have a far less um, lifespan than south facing timber uh, weatherboards. So the responsibility of the paint manufacturer, so our responsibility is to give you paint that's fit for purpose and it's manufactured to the appropriate standards. We're also gonna give you as much information about it as we can. So we're gonna give you technical data, we're gonna give you safety data, system specifications, we're gonna give you advice and support. But our guarantee or a manufacturer's guarantee is around film integrity and adhesion. The responsibility of the tradesman. Now theirs is all about the workmanship and everything that goes with it. So substrate condition and assessment, surface preparation, application methods and tools, product selection, adherence to the specification, adherence to industry standard guidelines, and environmental and clim climatic conditions. So there, everything that can have an effect on a paint coating is actually uh, the responsibility of the tradesman to control. So their, their guarantee covers the workmanship standards. Problems that almost always uh, occur are due to uh, poor substrate condition, poor surface preparation, incorrect application methods and tools, incorrect product selection, lack of adherence to specification, lack of adherence to, sub, uh, to industry standard guidelines, adverse environmental and climatic conditions, and high exposure levels. Now, I know for a fact that we're in, uh, we've got many sites being painted at the moment outside. We're in the middle of winter, so there's adverse environmental and climatic conditions. Um, anyone expecting that their paint coating at the moment uh, being applied at the moment is gonna last for a long period of time. Uh, if it's put on today and it's hit with rain, we're in Auckland, it's raining every 10 minutes at the moment. Uh, if it's put on today and it's hit with rain, who knows how long it's gonna last, but it's unrealistic to think that as an example, um, you're expecting a 10 year guarantee on that. Uh, paint coating might not last 10 minutes if it's hit with, paint, uh, hit with rain too soon after. So everything there you see is the control of the, uh, under the control of the tradesman. And the leading cause of coating failure worldwide is poor surface preparation. And that's, as we pointed out, down to the tradesman, that's in the workmanship area. Rosine have the uh, promise of quality. So there's a number of different documents out there through different uh, manufacturers and they all look different. They typically do come back to the same thing. It's around film integrity and adhesion uh, as a guarantee. Rosine have a really robust document that we put out into the marketplace um, that's really transparent that explains as best we can um, the, the expected um, life of your paint system based on substrates. Uh, and I'll just take you through it very quickly. Again, it points out really clearly on the document that products are guaranteed to provide film integrity and adhesion uh, for the uh, expected lifespan. And it states, it shows you interior and exterior um, uh, situations and we, we lay out the substrates as well. Now we're gonna pick out that area that I've got on the red box there, just to have a quick closer look at. And it shows you pretty clearly the general substrates, cementitious, metal and timber. On the left hand side there, you'll see that the surface condition, SC1's ideal or new, SC4 is really poor. So we're showing you there, based on the state of your substrate, how long you, we think things will last, providing the contractor has undertaken the work uh, to industry standard guidelines. So timber as an example, in ideal condition, SC1, you can expect 10 years. Now, where your sub substrate is in, uh, uh, in not ideal condition or poor condition or fair, as we say there is SC3. So it's, we, we're explaining uh, that there's some paint breakdown in that area and you do need to prepare that surface and there's spot priming required. 
you should expect six years lifespan on that. And when we say lifespan, we're talking about, that's about the time that you're going to need to be considering a repaint in that area. So as I say, that, that type of document gets you, gives you a really realistic um, idea of how long something should last. Now there's a few other things that go along with it. And so as we've talked about already, expected life figures are for vertical surfaces. Where you've got an angle to the sun and it's increasing that UV uh, impact on that surface, you can expect up to a 50% reduced uh, life expectancy. So we're talking about window sills there generally. Roofs as well are on an angle. It's the reason we put uh, solar panels on that angle on a roof, because that's the highest uh, impact to UV for them. And there's other conditions as well. So extreme marine environments, previous coatings failing, dark colors uh, reduce, re will reduce lifespan and substrate damage. So the old solvent borne products won't last as long as the new water borne technology as well. There's just simply not a lot of R&D gone into solvent borne products in the last 15 years or so, maybe 20 years. And also you're going to get issues like chalking, uh, colour change, gloss change over that time as well. So we're, we're showing you really clearly that there's, a, um, there's, there's things that will occur on a paint coating. It's a, it happens on all paint coatings. Key there, no change. Uh, for at zero, five is severe change. So you'll see that the chalking we've talked about in an exterior situation, uh, you're going to have some chalking occur. You're certainly going to have some uh, colour change and gloss change over that period as well. Um, so it's that's to be expected and we're stating it really clear and transparently on the document. Now we'll flick through protective coatings fairly quickly as well because I'm aware we're running short of time. Those that need to bail, that's fine. Um, you can come back and re-watch this as, you, um, as and when you uh, get the time. Protective coating is one that um, it follows much the same guidelines uh, around guarantees as we've uh, just shown, but does cover a few other areas as well. Protective coating systems um, are referenced as equivalent systems to the AS NZS 2312 standards, and they clearly show a durability period, which is the expected time to first major maintenance, so repaint. But what it means is that there's regular maintenance as well. So it allows those durability periods, allows uh, the owner to set up a maintenance program that needs to be carried out from year one. So it's not, durability periods aren't paint it and leave it for 25 years before you touch it. Uh, you should be maintaining that uh, surface on a regular uh, maintenance cycle. That's with anything actually that you've painted. So we'll just show you quickly now, again, we've covered this off. John Kilby covered it really well for us in a previous webinar, that's, um, which you can uh, go back and have a look at. We'll just cover it very quickly. So this is an example of uh, the 2312.1 standard, which is for mild steel. And we'll just show you the most common um, system that we come across or we're specifying as the PUR5 system. And it shows you very clearly that in the environment uh, C3 or C4, that's most commonly what we experience in New Zealand or most of the areas that we live in. Uh, you want a 25 year durability period on that paint system. And there is the, the paint system right there. Um, everyone's welcome to have this, we'll fire it out to you. Um, it's downloadable on our website as well. Shows you the surface preparation standard required. SA two and a half doesn't sound like much, but that's blast preparation of the steel uh, to a specific standard. Then you've got your primer, your intermediate coats, and your top coats, all with quite specific film build uh, levels there that are required to achieve a 25 year um, durability period. So again, another area that we provide is the quality paint, but we're not there to see the preparation or the application of the, uh, of the coating being applied at those specified film builds. And, and also with that, with the AS2312 standard, it's based on the assumption that all surfaces will receive regular rain washing. When you have sheltered corrosion, you can take those numbers and they will go down by on average about two thirds. Yeah, and that's a really interesting one as well, because we often get that um, an inquiry come in where, uh, you know, it's a, it's a natural, um, assumption is because something's under a canopy and it's and it's away from the weather 
um, it's going to last longer, where in actual fact, it's the other way around because it's not rain washed. Uh, it's the highest corrosion area that we experience. And this is just to show you the, the environmental uh, classifications as well. We'll flick through this pretty quickly. It, it states quite clearly what they are. And there's the maps that show you um, that most of the areas we live in in New Zealand are C3 or C4 environments. Um, as you zoom in, those that sea spray zone gets a bit bigger and there's, there's, there's other, um, other areas in there, but that's a pretty good indication of, of the areas, um, our environmental cate categories. So lots of words on screen there. We'll flick through this. This is, this is um, important to note though. So it's stressed that a durability range is not a guarantee period. Uh, it's a consideration, as we, I've already talked about, to help the owner to set up their maintenance program on their on their protective coating. Um, if a guarantee is required, now now guarantees generally aren't required, and it's probably something that I should have mentioned earlier as well. Um, if if they were required on every project, we'd get asked about them a dozen times a day, and we we don't get asked about them. They do come in occasionally, and we're more than happy to work with you as required, um, but a guarantee period, uh, say on a protective coating, is usually one quarter to one third of the expected durability period um, should be provided. So if you have a if you have a 25 year durability period, you should expect that any uh, guarantee of paint product from a manufacturer is going to be about seven to eight years, and it's set out in the um, in the um, standards guidelines there quite clearly. Um, you're already getting that from us and I'll show you on the promise of quality in a, in a couple of slides. And again, it's uh, important to note, and this is stated in the AS standard, AS2312 standards, that, that's backing up what I've already mentioned previously, is the coating type is only one factor in determining the durability of a protective coating system. Surface preparation, application procedures, design, local variations, environments, and all other factors will influence the durability of coatings. So as I talked about, um, to go in line, along with your, um, your durability periods on a protective coating, our promise of quality does actually cover this um, as well, because you'll see really clearly there that um, We've got, this is the same document that we've looked at previously. We'd be, if we're dealing with new steelwork, SC1 ideal. Um, you're looking at the metal area there. Um, and it shows you quite clearly that um, our expected um, lifespan of that system is 10 years um, as a guarantee period. And so where we say that uh, a quarter to one third of a 25 year durability period for a guarantee is seven or eight years. Well, we've stated there that it's 10 years um for metal so what we are doing now often with um with uh, protective coating specifications is we're sending out the promise of quality uh, we can personalize the promise quality for you as well um, all too often people um they want that bit of paper with their name written on it uh, you're not covered for anything more or less if your name's not written on it um, the promise of quality from resine uh, is the same level of um, assurance as any other document um, uh, that might be personalized or otherwise. So, so again, uh, same, ish, uh, same information for protective coatings. Paint manufacturer, um, it's about paint quality. Is it fit for purpose and manufactured to the appropriate standards? We'll give you all that technical support and information as well, but, Paint manufacturer's guarantee covers uh, film integrity and adhesion. Tradesman's responsibility, same, same responsibilities there. And um, there's one extra one down the bottom though. So um, quality assurance documentation and producer statements. Uh, that's the responsibility of the tradesman. So occasionally we come get um, people ask us for the producer statement. That should be provided by the contractor that undertakes the work. Uh, and with protective coatings, because you've got to achieve uh, the required film builds um, for the system, that there should be a quality assurance uh, program or documentation that runs alongside their application, recording those film builds as they go. 
So again, same problems that occur, um, the poor substrate condition, poor surface preparation. Now in protective coatings, that's even more uh, important and uh, in, incorrect application methods and tools, product selection, not adhering to the specification, um, environmental and climatic conditions and high exposure levels. Again, protective coatings, leading cause of coating failure is poor surface preparation. So just as a summary, just to um, just to finish us finish us off, um, and I'll let uh, you jump in if you want to in two seconds, Jeff. But by far and away, the most significant factors in the lifespan of a paint coating will relate to the workmanship standards, the substrate type and condition, adherence to specifications, industry guidelines, and exposure levels and conditions. Um, across the paint manufacturers, we're going to provide you with paint that's been manufactured to the uh, appropriate standards, um, but that is, um, that's the part that we play because um, when it's picked up at our, uh, our trade depots or our, or our paint shops, um, we typically don't see what happens to it from there. So do you want to jump in there, Jeff? Are you sure you finished? I have, I have finished. <laughs> Okay, just one thing about um, the guarantees, uh, particularly for protective coatings. We do not issue a guarantee um, other than the promise of quality guarantee unless there is a resin tech spec written prior to the job um, being started and we don't sign that guarantee off or I don't sign that guarantee off until the job has been completed. Um, and everything has been done according to the specification. That is a little different to the promise of quality, but certainly that's the only way that we can ensure with protective coatings, because quite often protective coatings are responsible for a building remaining um, upstanding, and um, so that's why we do it. So thanks very much. Sorry we went a little bit over. Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate your um, your insights today, and thanks to you all out there for tuning in. Uh, it was a bit of a whistle stop one that there was a lot of info there, and we sped up as we went. Um, we'll be uh, taking a slightly different tack next time. Back into colour, uh, Zena O'Connor will be joining us again from Australia, uh, and we'll be getting into some um, uh, delving into colour as well. So, thanks for tuning in. Uh, have a great day out there, and we'll catch you uh, next time around. Cheers, folks.